Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome to our final video of the Prosthodontic series. So this is everything that we talked about in our series, and if you haven't already, I would definitely recommend watching all the videos in this series. I think there are 24 total. And I broke down the material covered on the board exam into these categories, focusing on the highest yield information for you. And as you'll see, this information will really help you answer questions on the board exam. So I compiled several questions for us to go through together from old released questions, practice books, and questions that I modeled after actual exam questions when I took the exam. So these are going to be very similar to what you'll see on test day. All right, so question number one. Go ahead and pause the video, think through the question, and then we'll go over it together. All right, so for each question, let's break it down, start with what we know, and that's sort of my question answering philosophy is to always start with the information that you know. So the major connector is like the chassis or the frame of a car that all the other components are attached to. So it makes sense that its primary function would be to unite all the other components and provide some element of strength and structure. So of the answer choices here, A certainly sounds like the most reasonable and pr providing rigidity is in fact the primary function of the major connector. C, engaging the undercut below the height of contour is actually describing the retentive clasp arm, and D, passively touching above the height of contour, refers to the reciprocal clasp arm. So all of these are referring to one or more components of the removable partial denture framework, but A is the answer for the major connector. All right, question number two. Go ahead, pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so what is the first thing you should check when getting a crown back from the lab? So this question goes back to that list of eight things to do before delivering or inserting a crown. So always, always check the shade and aesthetics of the crown first. Now I have seen some comments and some board prep resources that say to check the internal fit as the next step after aesthetics. And in my original video, I said to check proximal contacts, then margin, and then fit, which is my own personal philosophy. But you may want to remember the order as internal fit, then proximal contacts, and then margin in that order. But regardless of which way you decide to go with, aesthetics is always first. And that's certainly the most important thing to remember for the board exam. So the answer here is B. All right, question number three. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll talk about this. All right, so this is one of those lab processing error questions and you're almost guaranteed to get a couple of these on the exam. So shrinkage always occurs when acrylic sets. Also when composite sets, polymerization shrinkage is one of those things you just can't get around. But more shrinkage occurs if there is excessive monomer. So the more monomer used, the more shrinkage you'll get, and actually the less heat you'll generate, and the, you'll have some reduced strength produced in the acrylic. So the, the ideal ratio of monomer to polymer is about one to three. And so if we have too much monomer, we're gonna have increased shrinkage. And so the answer here is C. All right, question number four. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this together. All right, so a dentist is preparing maxillary anterior teeth for metal ceramic crowns, also known as PFM crowns. Which of the following procedures is necessary to preserve and restore anterior guidance? So let's go through, this one's a little bit trickier. Let's go through each answer choice and talk about it. So the protrusive record gives you information about incisal guidance and condylar guidance. 
But remember, anterior guidance includes both incisal and canine guidance. So the protrusive record isn't quite enough for us to preserve and restore anterior guidance. So A is out. B, template for provisional restoration. So the template, of course, is good for making a provisional crown, but that's about it. And this would be one of those molds that we talked about, like a putty or a thermoplastic shim. So B is out as well. Let's skip down to D. So the, in the interocclusal record made in centric relation, that's usually done with that bimanual manipulation technique that I talked about. And this is to keep a record of the teeth closing while the condyles are in centric relation, which is the most anterior superior position of the condyles against their articular eminences, essentially home base for the condyles. So that's not quite relevant for anterior guidance. This is more a static record. And so C is the correct answer. Anterior guidance must be preserved by constructing a custom incisal guide table, which gives you information about both the incisal and the canine guidance in both protrusive and lateral excursive movements. So this is especially necessary when you're doing restorative procedures that change the lingual surfaces of the maxillary anterior teeth that guide the mandible in excursive, including lateral and protrusive movements. So the answer here is C. All right, question number five. Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so if a porcelain fused to metal anterior crown is too opaque as viewed from the facial, what is the most likely reason? So this one's tricky. So let's, again, start by eliminating incorrect answer choices. So A says that the incorrect shade was selected. Well, the incorrect shade could certainly lead to a poor aesthetic result, and the patient probably wouldn't be happy with that, especially if it's an anterior crown. But opacity means you cannot see through something, and it's really independent from the shade. Remember, natural teeth have a translucent quality to them due to the enamel layer having some translucency. And likewise, the enamel porcelain provides some translucent effect, while the underlying opaque porcelain layer blocks out the dark metal and oxide layer. And of course, that opaque porcelain is completely opaque. Let me bring up this diagram that shows that more translucent enamel porcelain, and then that thin, it's shown in yellow here, that thin opaque porcelain. So this brings us to our next answer choice. The tooth was overreduced on the facial surface. Well, being overreduced is bad for the tooth biologically because you're now closer to the pulp, but it's actually good for the crown aesthetically because the lab has more physical room to work with and to make the crown look nice. So the metal shown in black here and the opaque porcelain have to be a certain length for structural requirements and to be effective. And then the body, shown in this red and orange, and then the incisal porcelain, has to be thick enough to provide proper aesthetics. So actually, answer choice B is opposite of what it should say. The thicker we can make the body and incisal porcelain, the more room the lab has to make that crown look more natural and translucent, and not have that opaque layer shine through. So B is incorrect. How about C, porcelain was inadequately condensed? Well, this has more to do with strength than appearance. If this happens, this is another one of those lab processing errors, the porcelain will have some undesirable porosity in it, but it's not necessarily going to be too opaque because of this. So C is incorrect as well. And that leaves us with answer choice D, that the body and incisal porcelain layers are too thin. And so if the tooth is under reduced on the facial and the lab is forced to make the incisal and body layers too thin, then that opaque layer is going to show through and the crown will look too opaque. 
So the answer here is D. All right, question number six. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this together. All right, so which component of a removable partial denture is spoon-shaped and slightly inclined apically from the marginal ridge of a tooth? So this is a question, again, testing your knowledge of partial components. And if you recognize some of the keywords in the question, spoon-shaped, inclined apically, it's talking about being related to the marginal ridge, this is describing an occlusal rest. So the occlusal rest should be spoon-shaped, slightly inclined from the marginal ridge of the abutment tooth. All those things are describing a proper occlusal rest. Now I saw this practice question and wanted to include it because it is a little bit, I wanna say a little bit deceiving. And you may be saying, well, hold on doctor, can't indirect retainers be rests as well? And you'd be right. But remember that indirect retainers are located at the perpendicular bisector of the line between the most distal rests, which usually puts them in a more anterior region. So they're usually cingulum or incisal rests, which are not spoon-shaped and not associated with marginal ridges. So the occlusal rest is a better, more specific answer. So the answer describing, the answer, uh, the answer with this description most accurately would be the occlusal rest. So the answer here is C. All right, so now we're on question number seven. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll talk about this together. All right, so a posterior tooth has been prepared to receive a crown, but the clinical crown preparation is a bit too short. What can be done to improve its facial lingual resistance? So remember, when you have a short clinical crown, you may need to add some secondary retentive or resistance features to help that crown stay in place. So the consensus, we had a slide on this, the consensus is that Proximal grooves are if you lack resistance, you want a bit more resistance, and buccal grooves are used if you lack retention or if you want a bit more retention. Since this question is asking about how to improve the resistance, we want to create some proximal grooves as part of that crown. And so the answer here is B. All right, question number eight. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll talk about this. All right, so this one is a bit tricky. Which of the following best explains why the dentist should provide a posterior palatal seal in a complete maxillary denture? The seal will compensate for one of the following. So like I said, this one is a bit tricky, but there is definitely one answer better than the rest. We talked about this briefly, but the master cast is slightly carved around the area of the vibrating line. And that's to create, when the denture is fabricated and processed in the lab on this master cast, the, the acrylic can be slightly thicker in this region to ensure that the, the final denture is slightly thicker here and compresses the palate to create an ideal posterior palatal seal, which we know is incredibly important for retention of the upper denture. And this is done to compensate for the natural shrinkage of acrylic due to pol polymerization and cooling shrinkage. So the answer here is C. All right, question number nine. Go ahead and read through this question and then we'll talk about it together. All right, so which impression material provides the best dimensional stability? This one's nice and simple. We talked about PVS having essentially the best features of all the impression materials. So as soon as you see it's saying the best of some sort of quality, 
we know they're talking about polyvinyl siloxane or PVS, and so we don't have to go any further than that. The answer here is D. All right, question number 10. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll talk about this. All right, so what metal can cause greening of porcelain? So this is another one of those high yield facts that I mentioned. This was in the noble metals video and silver, uh, silver atoms can actually disperse and enter the body and incisal porcelain and cause this kind of discoloration of the porcelain. The phenomenon is called greening, although the actual stain can be a range of colors from yellow green to a more blue green like in here to even an orange brown hue. Now, even if you didn't know that silver can cause greening of porcelain, you could probably rule out gold and platinum because those are noble metals and they're all about promoting tarnish resistance. But definitely, if you haven't already, link silver with greening because this can definitely come up on the board exam. So the answer here is A. All right, question number 11. Go ahead and pause the video, and then we'll talk about this. All right, so what is a common feature between veneer and crown preparations? So let's go through each of these answer choices. So intra-enamel preparation is a feature for veneers only. Crown preparations should be into the dentin layer, and the intra-enamel preparation is actually the most important feature of the veneer prep. So this is not a common feature. That one's out. How about answer choice B, rounded internal line angles. So it's definitely important for both preparation designs because it limits internal stress and being rounded in dentistry is always good. Always having uh, good round, rounded internal line angles for cavity preparations, crown preparations is always a good philosophy. But let's just entertain the other answer choices while we're here. The functional cusp bevel is that secondary plane of reduction over the functional cusps. Now, I didn't talk about this because it's uh, sort of outside the scope of what you need to know for the board exam, but there are different veneer preps like uh, butt joint and window preps, and there's this one called incisal lapping prep design, which does include a, a more aggressive reduction of the incisal edge area. But still, this answer is certainly not a common feature for veneers. So this one is purely for those posterior crown preparations where you bevel the functional cusp area. So that one's out as well. And then for D, veneers are only covering the facial surface. So the margin is only going up to around you know, 180 degrees around the tooth, not the 360 degree uniform circumferential margin like in a crown prep. So the answer here is going to be B, rounded internal line angles. All right, question number 12. Go ahead and pause the video and then we'll talk about this. So another partial component question, which of the following components of the clasp assembly primarily provide support rather than retention or stability. And remember, retention, stability, and support were those three main principles that I dedicated an entire video to. So we can actually assign each of these three features to each of the components here. The minor connector primarily provides stability. The retentive clasp arm, it's right here in the name, provides retention. The reciprocal clasp arm provides stabi stability or bracing, and that leaves us with the rest, which provides support, that resistance to vertical seating forces. So the answer here is rest. All right, question number 13. Go ahead and read through the question, and then we'll talk about this. So what crown preparation feature is most under operator control? And this is another one of those nice 
sort of just reproducing high yield facts. And so the feature most under operator control is taper or parallelism. So the answer here is A. Okay, so the first day of the board exam, it's two days long. The first day will be 400 questions with uh, prosthodontics questions, just like the ones we've gone over today, uh, sprinkled throughout the exam. Now on the second day, you'll have 100 additional questions that are case-based. So they'll give you information on a patient with some clinical photographs and x-rays, and otherwise, the questions are very similar. So question 14 and 15 in this video will be examples of questions pertaining to the same patient. So you can go ahead and pause the video and then we'll go over this question together. So a 70 year old patient presents with the following maxillary arch and wishes to receive a removable partial denture. He has teeth number 6789 12 and 13. What Kennedy classification characterizes this arch? Now, side note, they probably wouldn't give you this picture. Um, I just like to have the visual there. They could very well just list out the teeth numbers, the tooth numbers, and then expect you to come up with the Kennedy classification, but you could easily draw that on your scrap paper uh, or something to that effect. So, now let's go about solving this problem. If let's say we had to draw it out on our scrap paper with reading the tooth numbers, now we have this drawing and now we can think about, well, the class one has bilateral distal extension, class two has unilateral distal extension. Remember the one and two kind of swap places. The class one has two distal extensions, class two has one distal extension. We see two distal extensions here, one on this side, one on this side. So we know it's a class one. So we can rule out B and D right away. And then the modification or the mod refers to every additional edentula space. So we accounted for the two distal extensions. We have not accounted for this bounded edentula space. So we have one modification. So the answer is class one mod one or the answer is C. And now question number 15. This will be about the same patient. So this, uh, go ahead and pause the video real quick if you want to solve this question and then we'll go over it together. All right, so this same patient has now been wearing his removable partial denture for about six months and presents for a routine recall appointment. An overextended flange has been irritating his right labial vestibule. What is this hyperplastic tissue reaction called? Now, pay no mind to the fact that he has no teeth. Let's just imagine there are some teeth there and he has this hyperplastic tissue reaction in this position. So let's talk about what all these words mean and what all of these conditions refer to. So the hypermobile ridge uh, refers to a flabby edentulous ridge common especially in the anterior maxilla. Now even if you didn't know all those details you could you could uh, deduce that this is talking about the ridge and not the vestibule so we could safely rule out A. Now B combination syndrome refers to a specific pattern of bone resorption in the anterior edentulous maxilla when it's opposing a mandibular uh, it's opposing mandibular anterior teeth only and then you have uh, flabby tuberosity and some other things so this is not quite what we're looking for it's not involving this hyperplastic tissue reaction so we can rule out answer choice B if we skip down to D papillary hyperplasia is also caused by irritation but it manifests as multiple papillary projections on the palate. So it's the wrong location again. We're, we're talking about the vestibule here. So D is also incorrect. So that leaves us with C, epulis fissuratum, and that is a hyperplastic tissue reaction caused by an ill-fitting or overextended flange. So your answer here is going to be C. 
All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching everyone, and I truly wish you all the best as you prepare for your board exam. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja and all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides if you want to take notes on them, and more practice questions just like these, so go check that out, the link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video.